Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our ADS for Rural America webinar. Uh, I can see there's people trickling in, so we'll give it just one minute for more people to get in. But we are with the University of Iowa National Advanced Driving Simulator. This is our second ADS for Rural America webinar. Um, this one is focused more on vehicle hardware and software. So we'll have a few presentations throughout. My name is Christine Ragantine. I'm the head of communications at the National Advanced Driving Simulator. Um, so just a quick housekeeping item. If anyone has any questions throughout, <clears throat> please put them in the Q&A feature and we will answer them at the end. Um, so Omar. Uh, Omar Ahmad is our project manager for the ADS for Rural America project. So go ahead, Omar. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we're really happy you took the time out to, to be with us today. Um, so as Christine mentioned, um, we're going to be sharing some details specifically related to the vehicle hardware and software uh, that we're utilizing for this project. Um, we are going to um, give you a very short project overview. Um, and then a, if you need more details, you're always welcome to go to our website and get more details there or contact any of us afterwards. Um, so after the project overview, we will provide a, um, a, a video overview, a live video overview of the vehicle. And then our technology partner from Autonomous Stuff will give you uh, more detailed information about the hardware and software that we're utilizing um, for this project. And after that, we will cover some of the software that um, we're using inside the vehicle um, that serves as interfaces for the, for the driver, for the co-pilot, and for the passengers. And finally, we will have some time at the end for your, for your questions. So the ADS for Rural America project, um, this was funded um, by the USDOT under the US Demonstration Grant Program. Um, and our project is really about looking at um, automation on rural roadways. Um, rural roadways are something that have been historically underrepresented when it comes to AV testing. Um, but it's really important to look at automation on rural roadways because while a smaller segment of the population lives in rural areas, half of all um, uh, crashes and fatalities occur on rural roadways. So if we're going to improve safety um, using automated vehicles, we need to do so for everyone, including folks that live in rural areas. Um, so our project is about, um, is about operationalizing uh, an, an ADS vehicle on uh, rural roadways and studying where things work well, where they don't work well, and then we're going, we're collecting a lot of data that we will be sharing publicly. And the data can be analyzed to help better understand where, when we encounter a challenge and where automation doesn't work well, what are potentially the reasons um, it doesn't work well. Um, it's also really important to, to note that um, it's, it, it's important to think about the people that we would be serving in those areas. So rural, areas have populations that are mobility impaired, um, older folks, uh, people with mobility impairments. And those folks currently have little or no access to public transportation. So if one day we have automated vehicles that are able to successfully navigate uh, these roadways, then we will have the potential to provide a great way for these folks to remain uh, mobile and get to their various places. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Greg Wagner, who will uh, give you an overview of the vehicle. Greg. Let me flip that around. Hi, I'm Greg Wagner, Senior Engineering Associate at the National Advanced Driving Simulator and Vehicle Lead for the ADS for Rural America Project. Today, I'm gonna to show you our vehicle, the automation hardware, and instrumentation installed to collect data not only on the vehicle, but also on our passengers and our safety drivers. Let me flip the camera.
All right. So here's our vehicle. It's a 2020 Ford Transit 350 HD. So we chose this vehicle for a few reasons. First, it meets the Buy American Act as it was manufactured at the Ford plant in Claycomo, Missouri. From there, it went to the StarCraft bus upfitter in Indiana. There, they made it ADA compliant by installing accessible doors, handrails, and a wheelchair lift. We purchased the vehicle through a dealership in Kankakee, Illinois, called Midwest Transit. We purchased this on funds, the vehicle itself, on funds separate from the US DOT funds, which made the process much simpler for acquiring a, via, a university vehicle. From there, it went to our technology partner, Autonomous Stuff, based out of Morton, Illinois. They installed all the automation hardware. <laughs> Sorry, we have a helicopter flying over. <laughs> uh, and made the vehicle it's with its automation hardware. And we also installed other instrumentation, like I mentioned, to collect uh, data on their passengers. So on the outside, <clears throat> starting on the roof, and everything I show you will be available uh, reference for you on a list that's Christina post in the chat. So starting on the top here, we have a Novatel GPS antenna. This is moving like left to right. There's another identical one on the other side. So it's a dual antenna system. We have a DSRC antenna. This camera is a for potential future use. Uh, top center, we have a Velodyne VLP32C LiDAR. Another potential future use camera. Uh, the black antenna on the side up there is our cellular modem antenna. We have a few other LIDARs mounted. This one on the side mirror is a 16 channel Velodyne VLP. One feature that's useful is this uh, data or shore power. So if we don't need to run the vehicle uh, by starting the engine, we can power everything up indoors by plugging it in. On the front bumper on the right, that, that square module is a continental radar. The other one in the center is the OEM radar. And the other device here on the bumper is a Visala MD30 road surface sensor. Now we'll go inside and look around. Inside, we have the passenger seating, two rows. And in the back is our wheelchair area securements. On the right side is where our uh, researcher would sit. They would have a laptop and there's a dedicated inverter, charger, power supply. Our passengers would have a, a tablet and they wear a physiological data collecting wristband and a paddock E4. Our safety driver also wears this wristband while they're driving. Um, so on the roof or the ceiling here, we have several video cameras looking at our passengers, recording that data. We also have a camera on the safety driver, our Wi-Fi access point for connectivity when we're out on the road. Let's look on this side compartment. In here, the touchscreen power distribution system. Uh, on the back would be our quantum R3000 data storage, another power inverter, another computer, and on the bottom right is the video recorder device. On the bulkhead, we have a uh, 42 inch TV display for our passenger interface to give, provide them with information. And Steve will be giving us a lot more information about this and some other inter human interfaces later on. 
behind this TV, this door flips up and in the cowl above the drivers and passenger seats is where two compute platforms reside. Uh, all the electronic hardware is like the cell modem itself, power distribution, uh, GPS sync, the Coda wireless onboard unit, a separate CAN data logger device, some Comtrol Ethernet switches, and other uh, power distribution devices. Underneath our front passenger seat, which we call our co pilot seat, is where the actual Novatel receiver sits. It has an integrated IMU and the shore power kit. Moving up toward the front, on the left here is our safety driver display and the, the video camera looking at that driver that's being recorded. A couple other video cameras, one looking forward, one back at the driver. This camera here, let me get closer up. This camera here is our one of the cameras that looks at traffic lights for light, traffic light detection. This is the other one. One has a zoom lens for picking up at a far distance. And then when you get closer to the lights, the other camera takes over. Center right below the mirror is the mobile eye uh, collision avoidance system. And then we have a Logitech webcam mounted here. This one's looking forward, obviously. We have another one mounted in the rear looking out the back. For our co-pilot, they have a display also. This is a Surface tablet, which they can use for various features, which Steve will be talking about again later. A co-pilot also has a uh, voice recorder. So when we have uh, out on our drive, we wanna mark events. We can just make notes of that by talking into that. And then here, the last piece of inf or data or instrumentation installed by autonomous stuff is the, uh, the, the gear selector. This is all controlled by what they call their pack mod system. So it controls the gears, selector, the steering, accelerator pedal, and braking. Uh, the braking, the traditional vacuum brake booster that's you know, under the hood has been replaced with a electronic brake booster. And also for development purposes, all this can be controlled with a game pad. Um, that's just for development. We don't use that on the road. Um, so that covers, I think, everything on the uh, hardware side. So, like I said, I think there's a link posted in the chat where it'll be a list of everything available. Uh, I mentioned a lot of Midwest vendors that we worked with and technology partners. Uh, another one we worked with was Manly Communications. They're out of Madison, Wisconsin. So with that, the map, the HD map we use and all the software and some of this other automation hardware, David and Jillian from Hexagon Autonomous Stuff we'll be talking about next. Thank you. Hey, good, good morning, everyone. Um, I am David Van Gein, and I'm here from Hexagon Autonomous Stuff, along with my colleague, Jill and Zhu. Uh, and we will be giving you an introduction to the vehicle, hardware and software specific to the software that's running in the vehicle. Um, so we look forward to doing that and thank you for the invitation to participate in the webinar. So for the uh, bit of an introduction here, what I will be going over is a vehicle platform development overview and an introduction to the PacMod system, uh, um, along with a software introduction, a little bit of detail about Apollo, then a hardware int introduction, such as the sensors and compute platforms that are used for the Apollo stack. 
um, following which uh, uh, Dylan will give a discussion on Apollo, give a bit more of a deep dive, discuss some of the effects of latency that we've observed and had to resolve, um, as well as uh, lessons learned at the end. So for the Ford Transit used in this project, we had to develop and design a new PACMOD system. What PACMOD stands for is the Platform Actuation and Control Module. And what this system uh, as a whole does is it allows for software to control the vehicle. So it lets it makes that connection between the software so that the brake, throttle, steering, turn signals, headlights, and some other miscellaneous systems can be controlled by software. Um, without that, you can't have software stacks like Apollo actually control the vehicle, let alone the joystick that Greg showed you there. So when we're um, when we're designing these systems, that joystick is often used to be able to test these systems at that level, uh, controlling the vehicle. So for the Ford Transit um, and this project, we designed a new system. Um, and PacMod is the main by wire controller. It has multiple CAN interfaces, uh, along with digital and analog signals that communicate with the vehicle. So these are for the for connecting to the different CAN buses in the vehicle, which may have steering control, brake feedback, brake control, et cetera, um, on different CAN buses. So this, this uh, PAC mod allows us to connect to those different buses. When, um, when the PAC mod is enabled, these signals allow the vehicle to be controlled from software. Uh, on the flip side, when the system is disabled or the power is cut to it, they're passed through completely. So it's as if the PacMod system didn't exist in the vehicle, um, therefore allowing the vehicle to be controlled manually like, like normal. Um, along with PacMod, and this varies depending on the type of vehicle, there can be Pac Mini modules as well as Pac Micro modules, which you can see up here on the screen. For the Ford Transit, the Pac Mini provides shifting and steering support, and there's actually two of them. Along with this, there's a PAC Micro, which is used as a watchdog module and provides for audible alarms and LED controls. So near that gear shifter that was shown in the previous bit by Greg, um, there's, there was a red light. And so that shows that the PAC mod was disabled um, and powered off. When it's enabled, uh, powered on and ready to be enabled, it's a green light, and then when it is enabled, it turns blue. So you get this visual indication of the state of the system and whether it's off, on, as well as enabled. Um, this, this system, along with the Ford Transit, we have developed for other vehicle platforms, everything from small electric golf cart type vehicles up to semi trucks, and with a wide range of vehicles in between. So now I'll do a little software introduction um, on top of this vehicle. The software that we're running is the Apollo Open Source Autonomy Stack. It's a full featured stack that allows the vehicle to be driven in automation on um, various types of roads, such as, our, such as our on the mapped route in this Iowa project. The software stack uses the HD map provided by Manly Communications. And we worked initially with Manly quite a lot on the, on the testing and development of the maps to use in Apollo as they were creating the map for this route. Since then, we engage to make changes to the map, um, such as speed limit changes as we find the vehicle needs to be tuned for different environments. And as, you know, as road networks changes, the speed limits that are officially in place don't always follow what, um, what might actually be necessary or what the average person drives. So being able to adapt to the needs of the road um, is important. And that goes along with updating HD maps throughout the life of a long-term project like this. Apollo, we have deployed in numerous vehicle platforms, um, such as the Lexus RX450, as well as the Ford Transit and Chrysler Pacifica. Um, for this vehicle specifically, we did add support for um, Apollo. We hadn't done it yet. So we actually have in Morton, Illinois, our own Ford Transit as well that we have deployed Apollo in and do testing there as well. On this vehicle, um, and to be able to use it on a new vehicle like this, it's a different shape, it's a larger, heavier vehicle. 
sensor placement is important and is, uh, you know, changes, changes from vehicle to vehicle. So in this vehicle, because of the height, the LIDAR is uh, a lot higher up and uh, you need more lighters to be able to cover the blind spots around the vehicle. Um, the camera heights are different, you know, so there, there, there's different transformations that are required to be able to use it in a vehicle like this. Along with this, uh, one thing we also did a lot um, for, for this project to allow the safety driver to enable and disable easily is a steering wheel engagement and disengage button. And this is so that they can uh, command the Apollo stack to disable without having to take over using the brake or steering forcefully. So in some cases, this is used um, in a situation where you know you want to take over or you're sitting at a, a light and need to take over to, to accomplish a maneuver. In, in this vehicle, uh, to be able to use Apollo, we have two compute platforms, one of which runs the full perception stack and has the camera feeds going into it. And we have one that runs all the other modules such as planning, localization, control, the CAN bus communication module, as well as, um, as, well as a few others. Um, on the vehicle, like I was mentioning about sensor choice and placement, um, you can see several pictures on the right of the screen here. There are multiple LIDARs. So there's the VLP32C that Greg pointed out in his walk around video tour. Um, there are two on the side mirrors and that gives blind spot and side vehicle detection. So when we're on the, the highway, for example, uh, two lane highway going southbound on this route and vehicles pass and approach on the left, that driver side LIDAR does an excellent job of detecting those vehicles coming up. So the stack receives information about them as it's approaching. In addition to those three LIDARs, there's also one at the rear of the vehicle to give feedback there to the stack. And there's a radar at the rear pointing that way as well. Um, in addition, there's a continental radar at the front of the vehicle giving long range detection capability, uh, which is particularly important on the uh, higher speed parts of the driving route. In addition to these um, used by the software stack, there are the two Leopard USB cameras, which are in the right kind of rightmost picture in the middle. They're behind the windshield. And what those are used for is detecting the state of signalized intersections on the route. Um, particularly important uh, on the way into Iowa City, where there are a number of stoplights uh, really back to back, very close together. Um, but being able to use automation on that portion of the route uh, is in many ways accomplished by having those cameras in the traffic light detection module. Along with, along with these sensors, um, there's the Novotel GNSS with RTK, and that's used for localization of the vehicle, uh, which places it on the map so the software stack knows where it is. And this is done with very high accuracy, thanks to the Iowa Department of Transport or IDOT's RTK network, which gives statewide coverage um, of, of R an RTK feed, so that's real-time kinematic data that the GNSS receiver uses to get accuracy down to sub, uh, sub three centimeters approximately. And having this very accurate localization data is uh, definitely very important for data collection and analysis as is the next bullet point, TimeSync. And where this comes into play, um, TimeSync is provided by the Novotel and using the Precision Time Protocol, PTP. So the two compute platforms on the vehicle receive a signal from the Novotel that allows the clock internally to be extremely accurate. And then as a result, the data from the LiDAR is timestamped separately as well which then as a result has every piece of data all time sync very well together um, so that the software stack knows how far in the past some uh, perception frame was generated such that the planning prediction of these events can be well done. So time sync, uh, extremely important. And uh, it is something that uh, was a, a good learning curve for this project actually, to be able to use and do this accurately and have it reliably work as well. 
So now I will pass it over to Jillian and he, he will be going into a deeper dive about Apollo and some other things. So uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, David. Yeah, before we decided to take Apollo as our autonomous stack for this project, we have worked with a few like open source autonomous software stacks. The first thing we consider is actual the way that the stack supports most of the traffic scenarios required by a project, such as lane following, lane change, protected and non-protected intersections. If they support all these scenarios, how good they actually perform as a whole system? Due to its complexity, all these autonomous stack have a modularized software architecture. The interfaces among different modules should hide all the complexities of the module to itself while at the same time provide all the required information to other modules. If we need to integrate a new sensor, design a new steering speed controller, or add a new add a support to a new vehicle platform, we need to consider how much development work we have to put to make it work. For robustness, we need to think about each module, how each module can detect faults, recover from faults, and prevent those faults. For example, what localization will do if the current GPS estimation is not good enough, the resolution such, for example, or in planning module, what it will do if it fails to find optimal path. The last one is the code quality. As developers ourselves, we find it's extremely important whether the code stricter follow a coding style or comply to an industrial standard whether it pays special attention to memory allocation, deallocation, which is extremely important for this kind of real-time operating, real-time system. Whether the stack has a good documentation of comments in the code. For such a complex system, there are always some third-party libraries get involved. We need to look at those third-party li libraries also, whether how good they are. So based on this analysis and our in-vehicle testing, with Apollo, we picked it for this project. So here is a simplified software architecture diagram of Apollo I take from their website, which shows all the main modules for the stack. There are two kinds of modules in terms of how the module start to process its input and generate its output. One is timer triggered, for example, such as control module and a canvas module. It's running just independently. It's totally timer controlled. They're running at 30 Hertz for the full transit. Some vehicle types can support 550 Hertz or even higher. In this way, we have a stable rate to control a vehicle and receive current state of vehicle regularly. Another kind of module is data driven. For example, the modules using this dashed yellow box, pre perception, prediction, and planning modules. The input to the perception module is basically sensor inputs. When in this case, in our stack, the main sensor is LiDAR sensor. It comes in around 10 Hertz. So every time the new data comes in, the perception callback function is triggered. It starts processing the input. It generates a list of obstacles surrounding the second ego vehicle. The output of this perception module triggers the callback of a prediction. In turn, the output of a prediction triggers the callback function of the planning module. The planning module generates a trajectory at around 10 Hertz. So basically trajectory, the control module can follow. The guardian and the monitor module mainly monitoring health of the system, such as the status of GPS, CAN bus hardware, LiDAR sensor, et cetera, and take action accordingly if unexpected events happen. HMI module is a web-based user interface called DreamView. We will show in the next few slides. In the lower left, there are two modules, the HD map module and the localization. They are used by almost every single module in the system. For instance, perception module need HD map to rule out irrelevant obstacles in the sensor measurements. The prediction module needs it to have a better estimation of the trajectory of the surrounding obstacles. Planning module need it to find a feasible path along the route. The importance of localization module is quite obvious. Without it, the vehicle cannot do anything, can't go anywhere. 
basically. So in this slide, we will discuss the main challenge we have dealt with in this project, the pipeline latency. More precisely, the latency here we are referring to is the time elapsed from the sensor input to the corresponding control output. With a human driver, it is the time elapsed from the, we see the surrounding traffic around us to the time we take action accordingly. Generally, we want it within 100 milliseconds or so, which means the planning module need to publish a new trajectory every 100 milliseconds. This is actually pretty challenging considering all the modules are involved and the volume of the data it has to process. There are three kinds of latencies in the system. One is processing latency within each module, for example, giving a sense of measurements, how much time perception needs to take to generate an obstacle list. The second one is the network latency, if the data has to be received from network in between modules. The third one is a scheduling callback latency. For example, a perception module worked so hard to publish a newly detected obstacle list. It is the underlying operating system which decide when to give some CPU time to the prediction module so they can process. If the system is busy with other high priority tasks, this callback can be delayed. Scheduling is a big topic in this kind of complex systems. Usually it, it takes a lot of efforts to tune a system to have a good overall performance in this regard. Here is the first video. Like, like basically it's, uh, we, the data was collected a few weeks ago when we were in Iowa City. This is, you can see the effects of latency. So the perception of scores updates, the latency can be varied from 100 milliseconds, sometimes can reach to 600 milliseconds. You can see the green fence in the video is kind of pretty jumpy. This is the data we recorded at the, around the same location. So this is after the, the, the tuning of the latency. So now the callbacks for the perception, planning, prediction all happens pretty regularly at around 100 milliseconds. In the video, you can see that green fence, all the other vehicles are moving, it's pretty smooth. As a real example, for example, let's take a highway driving example. As a self-driving, driving Self-driving vehicles is strictly respect the speed limit and less set as a hard constraint in the algorithms. But as, as human drivers, we usually drive a bit faster than that on a highway. So in, when we drive like transit on a highway, we notice that our vehicle is always passed by, by other vehicles. These other vehicles pass by from the side. After a while, when the driver feels safe, they will cut in in front of this eagle vehicle. Even the latency is pretty high. So in the planning module, we'll think those vehicles are much closer to us than they actually are. For example, they are already 50 meters away from, away from us. In the planning module, you still think, okay, it's only 20 meters ahead of us. We need to do some braking. So that kind of issue. Here are the main lessons we learned from this project. Although Apollo is a great open source autonomous stack, it does not necessarily mean we don't have to do any development work. It is just such a complex system in both hardware and software. It has more than 1 million lines of code. As David mentioned in the previous slides, time synchronization is critical for data collection and the whole modules running together seamlessly. We learned that we need like a balance the system load as much as possible to avoid some modules take all the resources while other modules are in hunger all the time. We need to take advantage of current hardware capabilities such as parallel computing on CPU and GPU. We have optimized quite a bit of code in perception module to reduce its end to end latency. We also learned that we need to keep control mode in mind while tuning planning module and vice versa. In planning module, each traffic scenario has its own configuration parameters. It should generate a trajectory which allows control module to follow well. Not only just it can follow, it has to be followed well. 
So physical limitations of the vehicle need to be considered. Sometimes we still have to make trade-off in between general cases and the corner cases. In summary, there was still a lot of work to be done to improve the stack. We're extremely happy to have this opportunity to work with the University of Iowa NAS Center on this project. It has been very present experience. We have achieved a lot. So I will pass mic to Steve. He will talk about data collection for this project. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Cable. I'm the uh, Senior Systems Administrator at the National Advanced Driving Simulator and uh, the Data Management Lead for the ADS for Rural America project. Uh, today, I wanted to give you kind of a, uh, a software overview of the, the other software tools that were uh, developed by the University of Iowa uh, that kind of work in concert with the autonomy software uh, uh, for the, uh, the needs of the project. Uh, so first, I wanted to take a look at a generalized software topology. So the software for this project can be thought of in sort of a layered approach. Uh, Jill and David uh, spoke uh, a lot about uh, the Apollo software, which serves as kind of the bottom of that virtual stack. Um, uh, the Apollo software, as, as Jill and David uh, explained, uh, handles all the autonomy uh, system, uh, all the autonomous uh, uh, activities of the vehicle, uh, like uh, speed and steering control, et cetera. Um, on top of Apollo, uh, we have ROS. And so one of the uh, design decisions that was made at the beginning of the project was how to store all of this data that was going to be recorded. Uh, and because of the breadth and the community use of ROS and automation, uh, ROS bag files were uh, chosen as the, the main uh, basis for recording. Um, so between uh, Apollo and Ross, there's a CyberRT to Ross bridge, and that facilitates the communication between Apollo, uh, Apollo's CyberRT system and Ross. Um, on top of Ross uh, is where the, a lot of, is where Ivy or the University of Iowa uh, uh, software comes into play. Um, uh, Ivy handles uh, things like all of the uh, interfaces, which I'll be going into more uh, into more detail about here shortly. Um, it handles the uh, centralized recording of everything because of the fact that we're recording not only uh, on the ROS system, but also uh, recording participant video as Greg uh, spoke about uh, earlier. Um, you wanted to have, we wanted to have some way of being able to have a single button uh, start and stop to recording and, and ways to, to facilitate that. Um, and so all of, all of the interfaces that are developed that are uh, contained within Ivy are all web-based and they're driven by Node.js and, and WebSockets. So today I'm gonna give kind of a, a brief overview of some of the interfaces that are located in the vehicle. Um, uh, they'll include the central information display, which is a 42-inch uh, display at the, the front of the passenger compartment. Uh, there's the passenger HMI, which are on the tablets that are given to each passenger. Uh, there's the safety driver interface, uh, which is located uh, between the mirror and the uh, windshield for the uh, safety driver. And the co-pilot interface, which is located in the, in the co-pilot seating area. Um, not pictured here, but it'll also be referenced. There's also a researcher interface, which allows for uh, the researcher in the in the rear position of the vehicle uh, to control or uh, influence the participant tablets and back. So first of all, uh, talking about the uh, central information display. Uh, so as Greg uh, pointed out earlier, this is a large 42 inch display that's at the, the front of the uh, vehicle. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention uh, in talking about the central information display and the passenger HMI is that they're both designed uh, in collaboration with a clinical ophthalmologist uh, to refine best practices for uh, uh, populations with uh, uh, visual impairments. Um, so that takes into account not only things like uh, font size and, and colors used, uh, but also spacing and things like that were all uh, kind of 
handpicked as, as we went through the design process. Uh, so kind of uh, to give a layout description uh, from left to right here, on the left side, uh, we see in the top left, we see the automation status. Uh, that was one of the things that we wanted the participants to know whether they were driving under manual control or automation control. And, and the idea being that since they're all wearing the physiological devices, does that change their perception or their anxiety? Um, so that, that displays the automation status. Uh, below that, you have the uh, heading and location of the vehicle. In the center, uh, there is a map that shows, again, the heading and, lo and location of the vehicle with this green uh, triangle. Um, also, the current time. Uh, and then on the right side, you have uh, a, uh, the current stop or the next location and calculated arrival time uh, to that uh, next stop. Um, and also, the, uh, the future destinations beyond that next stop and their uh, associated arrival times. Um, so both the central information display and again, the, the passenger display, which I'll be talking about next, have uh, day and night contrast modes. Uh, again, this was in, in keeping with the idea that because we collect data during uh, daylight hours and at nighttime hours, um, being able to switch between a black on, on white and a white on a darker background uh, uh, was kind of an important thing. Um, and the other thing that the, the sensor information display does is announce uh, stops with an audio cue. Uh, so it'll not only announce the stop, but it will also uh, announce where uh, the uh, sidewalk is in uh, relative position to where the vehicle is parked. Um, that was kind of one of the things that came up during our again, initial planning and talking with a local transit operator on, on campus here is that uh, a lot of times it's not thought about uh, for uh, visually impaired population. They may not know where the, the uh, sidewalk is in, uh, in relation to the vehicle. So again, even though nobody was getting on or off uh, at, in, in this project uh, at each stop, it was still something that was taken very seriously and, and put into the into the design. Uh, next, talking about the pasture HMI. Uh, so this again, this was the uh, this is the the interface that is on the tablets that are given to each uh, individual passenger. Um, it is a multifunctional display that shows the position again shows a the position and heading and location of the vehicle. Uh, the map is zoomable, like so you can, like a participant could zoom in and, and kind of take a look at things that way. Um, it also was meant as kind of a, a, uh, a device that they could use for browsing places and events at each of the uh, stop locations. Uh, there's uh, web browsing is available, and then also they have the ability to summon help by hitting that help button at the top, which then reflects back on the researcher interface, which I talked a little bit about for, but this is down here in the lower right. Uh, this interface is used by the researcher in the back uh, to uh, send uh, Qualtrics surveys or send surveys to to each of the, uh, all of the passengers or individual passengers, uh, as well as to, again, uh, set the, uh, the contrast state of that, of this uh, central information display at the time. Um, so next we have the, the safety driver interface. Um, the safety driver interface, the main goal of, what, of it was to provide situational awareness uh, for the safety driver. Um, so I'll kind of, again, walk through the, the, the layout here uh, of the interface. Again, this is located to the, it's in between the uh, driver's uh, uh, outside mirror and the, the front of the vehicle. Um, from the bottom, uh, in the bottom of the display, uh, we show again a map with location, heading, uh, and as well as the route and weather and road conditions. Um, the middle is kind of the the gives the main uh, state of automation, um, as well as the current speed and if the vehicle is in automation, uh, shows the target speed of what the uh, automation is is trying to to achieve. Um, if a upcoming traffic light is detected, uh, uh, David, Dylan, and, and Greg all show the, the forward-facing cameras that, that 
do traffic light detection. If a traffic light is detected, uh, this will also show here, uh, it's showing what would happen is if it saw a green, if it detected a green state on the, uh, the tr traffic light that's ahead of the vehicle. Um, and then on the right side, uh, you have some information, a visualization of uh, some of the information from the mobile eye unit, uh, which uh, shows uh, detected uh, lane markings as well as uh, lane position and geometry. Uh, on the uh, also in the in the center, if a dangerous road condition uh, is detected, um, uh, there are warning icons that will uh, show up. Uh, so for things, it takes a look at the road sensor and uh, checks for conditions that would be uh, that would be ripe for uh, hydroplaning or uh, slick roads, things like that. Um, on the top of the display, uh, the top is kind of a multifunctional. Uh, it's the multifunctional portion of this display. Uh, for the most part, during uh, data collection, uh, this Apollo uh, tab is selected. That gives a uh, the safety driver a look at uh, the dream view output from Apollo. Um, again, since the 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 goal of this is to give situational awareness, this gives the safety driver an idea of what uh, the autonomy software is planning on doing, uh, what it can see, uh, et cetera. Um, also up there uh, the, in the multifunction uh, portion of the display, um, it's also has uh, generalized health of uh, different subsystems. And each one of these tabs basically tells, it gives, can give the driver more additional uh, diagnostic output. So for things like uh, selecting ranging, uh, it'll give you uh, the, a visualization of what the forward continental radar sees, as well as uh, lets you know how many scans per second the LIDAR uh, is producing. Uh, if you're clicking on uh, the GPS tab, uh, it gives you an idea of the uh, health of the GPS, uh, the GNSS solution, uh, as well as like uh, RTK standard deviations, um, as well as, as, as some other things. Um, uh, so that kind of describes the the safety driver interface. Uh, the copilot interface is again used by the copilot and is is shares a lot of lineage with the safety driver interface. Um, so as you can see up here at the top, has the same subsystem health uh, uh, indicators. Um, but again, kind of kind of walking through the layout uh, in the lower left, there's the same cutout from DreamView. Uh, which would be identical to the safety driver display, again, to give the co-pilot also an idea of, of what the intentions of the vehicle are going to be. Uh, the upper left shows uh, camera outputs, um, and the main portion of that is the rear camera, uh, mostly to facilitate conversation between the co-pilot and the, the safety driver of if there's you know congestion or something that, that is showing up behind the vehicle. Uh, the right side, um, again, I talked about showing subsystem health, uh, but it also shows uh, different vehicle sensor states, including uh, state of automation, uh, uh, but just kind of gives a general uh, look at things there. Um, the right side is also where state and mode control is, uh, is, is set, uh, and the, uh, the parameters and, uh, for the, each individual recording. Um, the recording again is boiled down to uh, one button, which then fires off three different recordings and can manage the state of those. Um, one thing to talk about is uh, on this interface is this flag button that's over here on the right. That is how kind of in real time, the co-pilot has the ability to uh, lay down uh, markers inside the recording. Um, and because we wanted it to be a fairly natural thing for, for them to do, uh, they just need to hit the button and then generally they'll speak into that voice recorder uh, for later kind of annotation into the data stream. Um, but again, the idea was to have something as, as simple as possible uh, to, to maintain kind of a lower level workload, just because there is a lot of, of attention that not only the safety driver, but the co-pilot's doing as, as these drives uh, go along. So kind of putting everything together, um, I, this is a, a training drive 
uh, that happened before data collection started, but it kind of shows all of the uh, how all the uh, interfaces work in concert, um, uh, as well as what the uh, what the output from that passenger uh, display video uh, passenger recordings uh, would look like. Um, so here we're driving a manual, and they're flip, uh, 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 clicking into automation mode. Um, and again, this this is what everybody would be seeing basically while while driving down the road. Um, that being said, so that again is kind of a a very quick overview of the interface software. Um, then most of what I talked about today was focused on uh, things that that deal with the activities during actual data collection. Um, uh, not talked about today, but but worth mentioning is that there is a good amount of other uh, software and tools developed uh, during the project, um, both for uh, dealing with the data and also uh, you know getting quick information out of it afterwards. So um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to help. Uh, otherwise, I'll I'll turn it back over to Christine. Okay, great. Thanks everyone, great presentations. So we've had a number of good questions come in, so we'll try to get through all those. And if we can't get to all of them, we will uh, try to email you with, with the answers to your questions. So first question, it was mentioned that the cameras are for future, a couple of the cameras are for future use. Does that mean all of the other sensors listed, such as the multiple LIDARs, radar, road profile sensor, are being used by the autonomous stack? I can answer that. Um, I, so the the quick answer to that is no. Um, a lot of uh, there are a lot of sensors uh, on board the vehicle, such as the the mobile eye unit, the Vaisali unit, uh, the forward and rear facing uh, webcams uh, that are not used in directly in Apollo. Uh, but we felt it was a good idea to have. They are represented in the recordings, so you can actually reference uh, the uh, the detected state of things uh, during the drive from those uh, sensors, they just aren't used in the, the decision-making uh, for uh, the autonomous stack. Okay, great. Next question, is any subset of the data uploaded near real time or is it all stored on the shuttle and then uploaded post-trip? So I can also answer that one. Uh, the uh, there is one of the, the pieces of software that we didn't talk about today uh, is there, the vehicle is actually broadcasting uh, uh, the forward and rear facing video as well as, the, uh, as all of its telemetry data. It is broadcasting that live and it is being viewed by a remote, uh, a remote researcher uh, here at NADS during the time. It isn't being recorded live mostly because of you can get into a discussion of, of uh, uh, cellular connectivity in rural areas, uh, which is still, as we, as we learn uh, from this project, it can get dicey in areas. Uh, so it's not a very reliable source of, of live recording. Most of the, the, the actual bulk of the recording is actually done on the vehicle itself and then offloaded uh, afterwards. Okay, um, next question. You mentioned cameras to detect traffic light detection. Did you, add, did you also add DSRC radios to communicate with the onboard DSRC unit that you mentioned in the hardware summary? I can take that. Um, so yes, so there are actually DSRC radios installed in the vehicle, and I believe there, there will be another one added for a future phase of the project. Um, but uh, they're not used right now because the, so the traffic light intersections don't necessarily all have compatible or DSRC radios at all. So using the cameras to detect traffic lights is, uh, is quite important to be able to do that as well. But it is something that we could potentially do in a future phase. And there is plan to do some V2X integration um, using DSRC or CV2X. Okay. Um, David, are the Mandalay map changes you you described something done by the Iowa Autonomous Stuff or Mandalay teams? So the actual map changes are done by Mandalay, um, and that that's after a number of testing runs and you know analysis of data for specific changes to be made, say to a speed change or 
the radius of a corner, um, things like this based on actual experience test data, um, you know, basically done by, by your team and then by us looking at the data as well, and then advising Mansley on where we would like changes to be made. Okay, next question. In the two compute platform, what do all other modules include? How how are these two platforms or how do these two platforms communicate with each other? And why do they have um, why do we have two compute platforms? Yeah, I can take that. Right, we're basically one PC is basically we call it a perception PC. It runs like a perception, traffic lights, and the camera or other modules, for example, Canvas module, control module, planning module. And those modules are running on the first PC. The communication between them is just, uh, Apollo has its a cyber framework, which is DDS based. So it's using fast RTPS protocol. So that's how it was, the modules, how the communication happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is the range of the Novatel GNSS? I'm not sure, I, I can try and take this. I'm just not sure exactly what the question refers to in range, but um, I guess the range of the RTK network does cover the whole state. So for getting these RTK corrections that bring the accuracy very high that you can get across the state of Iowa. And there are other RTK networks for other states. There's also large global ones. Um, but yeah, the range, I, I guess, I, I'm wondering if that's what the meaning of range was. That's my guess. Okay, it was mentioned that the point of the study was to find out situations that are difficult for autonomous vehicles in rural areas. How can we extrapolate or generalize the issues faced by this particular vehicle to the whole group of autonomous vehicles, which might have different sensors, actuators, planning and control modules? I can try and take that one. Um, so when we started the study, um, we took a look at what we were trying to do in terms of the use cases. Um, and we made design choices on the on the what sensors we were going to use and what um, publicly available automation software we we're going to use. And our choices reflect kind of um, the best that was available at that time. Um, I think that uh, obviously this is one vehicle with one set of software and and a specific set of sensors. Um, but I. I, I'm confident that what we're learning from this project is reflective of the general state of um, where automation technology is at. Um, and I think that what we need to do is we need to not just have this one instance, um, but we need to have a few different test cases in rural areas from different institutions using different types of vehicles. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, we have two similar questions, so maybe we can answer these together. In a previous webinar, you spoke about challenges of gravel or unpaved roads. Has there been changes to address that and uh, that was in the Apollo or somewhere else and other preparations for winter testing, thinking snow covered roads? And then how well does the system perform in different weather conditions such as snow, rain or fog? Good. Yeah, um, so I could take a bit of this. Um, for the gravel roads or you know, unpaved roads, the one, one, one of the big things was shifting the center line, or not the center line of the road, but the center line of the lane. So this is actually in the map and you have you know, a road boundary on either side plus the center of the road. Um, and then each lane has its own kind of trajectory center line. And we, uh, for the unpaved road, Code, uh, segment, what we did is we went back to Mandley and asked for a shifting of that center line about 18 inches towards the center of the road so that the vehicle wants to track nearer to the center of the road without crossing the center of the road. Um, so then it's a bit further away from the soft edge of the shoulder, but it, if there were an oncoming vehicle that were kind of right on the center line, it could still shift and maneuver slightly towards the right to get by it as well. So this seemed like the kind of, it, it was an easy um, solution to this problem in, 
without too many modifications to anything other than the map and some constraints in one of the right. uh, one of the optimizers. It's, it's almost like a design on purpose this way inside Apollo. So they have like a road, they have a left boundary and right boundary. They also have like a center curve. The center curve is not necessarily a physical center in between the road, left boundary and right boundary. It's just some reference line that you go vehicle should follow. So in this case for gray road, we can easily just modify the map, shift to the center curve, like laying a little bit. Apollo can just follow that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as far as preparations for winter testing, um, this isn't something that's being done right now as part of this project, but it is, it is a major question, you know, for this type of project and other types of automation just on any type of road surface yeah. where there's different weather conditions. Um, there is that Vaisala sensor that Greg showed in his video tour at the front of the vehicle that does detect uh, variations in the road, I think. And there are also other road sensors that can be installed, you know, to give moisture and feedback on whether the road's wet or dry, um, snow covered, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, potentially you could adjust the, the have the Speed stack up. react to have lower acceleration, deceleration rates, maybe lower maximum speed, this type of thing not something that's currently implemented in the stack. Uh, it's different uh, doable based on those sensors, extra information about road conditions. We can modify the speed profile parameters. So we can generate a different kind of speed profile in this kind of special weather conditions. Yeah. Okay, um, Omar, do you wanna talk a little bit more about our, our experiences with the uh, winter driving and then we'll have to wrap up. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think I just want to add one thing to the discussion that we just had. Um, you can throw all the sensors you want um, on a vehicle, but the core software that's that's being utilized has to be smart enough to take the data from the sensor and actually do something about it. Um, and in our experience, yes, we do have a, a weather, a, a pavement surface sensor, um, and we are collecting data from it. But the automation software that we're utilizing. And, um, and I don't know of any automation software um, that actually takes um, data from a weather sensor and then it actually adapts its how it drives or how it behaves in real time based on, based on that data. Uh, so our experience is that yes, it is possible to drive on snow covered roads because the HD map enables you to localize yourself on a specific lane and so you don't need lane markings, but that's only part of the story. Um, because what happens in snowy weather is that normal human drivers, they tend to bias their driving towards the center of the, of the road. And so they essentially create a new lane, um, but the automated vehicle is gonna wanna follow the perfect lane as, um, as uh, described by the HD map. And what can happen is that the automated vehicle can end up driving on where there has been ice that has been deposited from the tires of other normal human driven vehicles. So in fact, even though it's, perf it's perfectly tracking the center of its lane, it might actually be driving on what is a more dangerous part of the lane. And uh, to, our testing has shown that for the moment anyway, automation software does not adapt to, the, to those types of situations. Okay, there were a few questions that we did not have time for, but we will try to get to you via email. Um, so thank you all again for joining. Um, there will be a recording of this if you need to refer back to it or share it with any of your colleagues available on our website. Um, you can learn more about our project on our website, our newsletter if you're not subscribed to that or follow us on social media. So thank you again.